bunch of ways that you can get a hold of me. And either one of them is just about as good as the other. The two main ways of getting a hold of me are via email, uh, two versions of email. One is the email facility that's available via Canvas, and the other is just my regular Lorraine Community College email, which is mzellers at lorraineccc.edu. Either one of those will work, though. Email is better than the phone for me because I answer my email pretty regularly, uh, and I answer my phone uh, messages typically only when I'm on campus. So, I mean, over the weekends I'll check my email, but I won't check my phone messages usually until I get back in. All right, so it's probably better to email me rather than phone message me. But if you're in a pinch and you need to get a hold of me, you can, you can certainly leave a message on the phone and I will get it. Um, feel free if I don't respond to your email or I don't respond... Uh, if I don't completely answer what your question was, feel free to, to remind me or just say, hey, you know, you really didn't answer that question or I sent you an email a couple days ago and I didn't hear a response back. That's fair, all right? Uh, I won't be upset if you, like, send a reminder like that, all right? Because usually my, I, my goal for uh, email is, like, if you send it today, I should respond sometime tomorrow, all right, at the latest. Uh, if so, if it goes a couple of days, then maybe it got lost in a shuffle or whatever. In which case, feel free to, to email me uh, again. Uh, one thing I do in this class is I have normal office hours, which I haven't yet defined yet for the semester, but I will soon. All right. But in addition to my normal office hours, I make all my other labs available to any students. All right. So this class has a lab. I have two other classes, and they have labs. A student can show up to any of my labs if they have questions. So that sort of gives like extra office hours, more or less. All right. Uh, I will post the hours of my other labs. My other labs are uh, on Monday and Wednesday. One is from, that's a good question, what one is from. One is from, what is uh, late morning, and the other is early evening. All right, so if you have night classes or whatever. I also will post office hours soon, and if none of those work, feel free, we can arrange another time. All right, um, so like if you can't meet during any of those times, uh, keep in mind that the lab is also designated as a time for you to get assistance with any questions or problems that you have. If you can't meet during any of those times, we'll figure something else out. I mean, you know, chances are we'll have some schedule uh, free times in common that we can connect and uh, discuss whatever issue you have. Uh, this is an important part of my syllabus, the uh, ways to contact me, because the one thing I don't want is I don't want a student to be struggling and uh, not asking the questions and not feeling that they have a way to contact me to ask questions, all right? It agonizes me to hear people in other classes, not necessarily CISS classes, but just other classes on concept say, I can't get a hold of my professor, I have a problem, I can't get a hold of them. All right, that's, that's kind of, uh, that's a bad situation. Uh, if you put forth the effort, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put forth the effort to get back to you and, and uh, connect with you. Uh, you, in some respects, you have to drive it, though, because I can't read your minds to see how well the material is connecting with you or not. All right? So that's all I ask is meet me halfway. Contact me, discuss if you have any problems, and I'll do my best to correct them. Uh, here is a syllabus, by the way, and you should read this because I'm just going through the quick version of it. On top of the page are all the different ways that you can contact me. All right, there you go. I can Skype if you want. Uh, I've done that with effect. That, that's perfect for days 
season, the weather's nasty, and you don't want to, uh, you know, you don't want to come down here or whatever. We can chat online uh, through Canvas. We can meet in person, discuss over the phone, and so on. So I spent a lot of time emphasizing this because I don't want to hear, gee, I had problems and I couldn't get my questions answered. All right? At least I want to give you the opportunity to do that, to meet me halfway. All right? So I spent a lot of time emphasizing that. This material you can all read on your own. It's important. It sort of puts the class in perspective of why are we studying this? What are our goals for taking this class? Uh, textbook, storage media, any of you that have had labs here know that when you save files to your machine, you, uh, they, don't, they don't stick around. All right? uh, the next time the machine is rebooted, they're gone. So therefore, you need to keep a copy of them. So USB drive, you can email them to yourself. You have some space, I think, on Canvas that you can upload it or whatever. I will use Canvas to communicate to students. Uh, so check Canvas between classes. You know, even if you don't have anything to turn in, just check Canvas. I would say between the classes, so sometime over the weekend and then maybe sometime Wednesday. What I do there is I'll post corrections or mistakes or, uh, well, hopefully I'll post corrections of mistakes. I won't post mistakes, but if I had already posted mistakes, hopefully I'll post a correction to the mistake and so on. This is your class. Let me know what I can do to make it more meaningful, all right? Uh, Read this on your own. College policies, read on your own. Instructor policies, I'm pretty flexible about late assignments, uh, provided that I know that you're sincerely working on them and you're having difficulty and you just happen to get this one late. So, for example, if you come down with the flu and you can't get an assignment in on time, when you turn it in, drop a note that says, I, I wasn't feeling well. All right, and, and so I'm a little late on the, on the assignment. And that's okay. That's fine. If, however, you simply disappear, like you're not in class, I don't see you in class, I don't see you in lab, and then week five you turn in lab one, well, I reserve the right to deduct late points for that. I mean, that's only reasonable. If you have issues that you don't want to get into, if you have a personal issue or for whatever reason you don't want to get into it, you don't really need to give me details. You can just say, hey, I have a personal issue. I'll probably be late with this next assignment. And that's fine. Uh, don't use this as a crutch, however. If you're late for an assignment here or there, it's no big deal. If you are habitually late, that is, you never turn in an assignment on time, then something needs to change. Maybe you need to spend more time working on the class. Or maybe we need to sit down and discuss and get some of your questions answered or whatever. All right? So... A late assignment here or there, no problem. Continually late, well, we need to look into it to see exactly what the deal is. Uh, and I think that's fair. Read through the details of the policy uh, if you want. There are, your, your grades consisting of uh, sort of three different things. There's homework assignments. There'll be one nearly every week with a couple exceptions. There is a portfolio that you accumulate and you'll turn it in halfway through the semester and you'll turn it in at the end of the semester. The portfolio is really just an accumulation of all the assignments that you've done with some comments about the assignment by you. And then finally there is a final semester project which again is turned in in two parts, the design portion and then the final project. And the grades are the standard 90, 80, 70, and so on. Uh, this shows you the schedule of what topics will be covered and when stuff is due. So assignments are due the Thursday of the indicated week. So there's nothing due this Thursday. All right? Next Thursday, Lab 1 is due. The Thursday after that, Lab 2 is due, and so on down the line. Uh, you'll notice you have almost weekly assignments except week 8. Instead of having a new assignment, your portfolio part 1 is due. Week 11, your project design is due. Week 15, your portfolio is due. And then week, the finals week, your final project is due. Okay, so that's what your grade is made up for. 
The portfolio and the project we will talk about in class, but not today. I would suggest that between now and next week, you spend some time to review those two things. And there are sections about those on Canvas. Your Canvas screen is going to look a little different than mine, but there's a module for portfolio. There's a module about the semester project. So before next week, uh, read, read that on your own. And next week, we'll, next week or in a subsequent week, we'll talk about uh, them um, in more detail. Every week is going to have a module. So as I said, an assignment is made. An assignment for week one, lab one, is due the following Thursday. So this assignment, lab one, is due on the 31st of January, which is next Thursday. Every week there's going to have a to-do this week, which is simply a list of the things that we're going to do in class and sort of the expectations. And some of the things that I want you to do. All right. This is where the lectures to the class will be posted. All right. And I will also post any examples that I have in class. So if I come up with something, uh, I will post it in the module for that given week. All right. But do be aware that the lab for week one is, is due during week two. So when you see that, note the due date and note that it said on the syllabus that a lab is due uh, sort of the week after that it was assigned. So it's assigned this week, it's due next week. All right. That sometimes causes confusion because they see it under week one, they think you have to do it under week one. It's like, no, I'm assigning it during week one, it's due during week two. All right. I guess even if you do misinterpret that, the worst case scenario is you turn in the lab early, which wouldn't that be horrible. All right. Any questions about this and how the class is made up? Well, that's probably the quickest I've given that which out of necessity, but, but that's good. Let me take attendance, which I should remember to do. I don't always do that, but I like to do that at the beginning of the semester since uh, it's a good way to at least start learning your names. Uh, and it's also, uh, I, I need to report attendance for some reason to make sure that people have showed up. Uh, please don't move. No, you can move if you want. I was going to say, it's always confusing if people move seats, and I'm not sure. It's also confusing how territorial people get about their seats. Once they've sat in a seat, if someone sits there the next time, it's like, you know, wow, that's some conflict there. If I mispronounce your name, let me know. Uh, other than that, um, we'll go. Uh, let's see. Aiden Bundy? Rico Daniels? Yeah. Jeffrey Fola? Yeah. Dylan Hughes? Casey Eisen? Kyle Janka? Right Ashley Lopez? Michael Pack? Right Louis Sabala? David Martel? Muna Shabab? Zachariah Zbon? Is that close? Uh, Spahn. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, Liu Shukai Tang? Okay. Jesse Toy? Mm -hmm. Candace Traster? Traster. Traster? Jacob Walker? Okay. So just one person not here. All right, absolutely. Uh, one thing I did in previous semesters is I asked students to like give a fun fact about themselves. But I've seen on numerous Facebook posts from people that I know that are college age that students hate that. So I'm not going to do that. All right. So you can thank your friends on social media that have complained about giving a fun fact about themselves in the first day of class. You can thank them for you will not have to do that today in class. All right. Um, let's talk about web pages. Let's talk about the anatomy of web pages. Uh, let's, let's, let's think of a web page. Um, let's pick ESPN.com. Why not? I'm not a gigantic sports fan, but it seems fairly non 
controversial, so we'll look that up. There's a web page, all right, for you. And you notice on it, there is a bunch of stuff. And there's a bunch of different stuff, all right? There are images. There might be, well, here we are. There is a, a video. There is text. And some of the text is just plain text, right, just words. Whereas some of the text are links, all right? In addition, there's all kinds of things. There's different color for text. There's different fonts used. There's uh, different uh, font uh, embellishments like bold and maybe underlined somewhere and so on. So there's a bunch of stuff on the web pages. And yet, web pages are just plain text files. Do, does anyone know what it means when I say it's just a plain text file? What does it mean when I say it's just a text file? It just has text in it. What do I mean by text? Just letters and numbers. All right, nothing special than that. In fact, we can view the the contents of a web page simply depending on the browser, but by saying view page source. And this is the code for the web page. There's a lot of stuff here because this has a lot of content in it. But we can even find some of the stuff on here if we want. For example, let's find something. Let's find something on this page. Hall of Fame announcement. All right. Let's. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's a search. Fine. Is that here? Control F. Control F. I am notoriously known for not using shortcut keys. So, Hall of Fame. Here we go. Hall of Fame announcement day. So there's the text for that. All right. It's on the page. It's all in there. Everything on the page is in there. Yet, how does a web browser know that that Hall of Fame text is supposed to be? Well, it's supposed to be a link is bigger than the other content, and so on. How does the browser know that when it's just plain text? Any ideas on that? Yes. The heading markup? Through, yeah, in this case, there's heading markup. And the word markup is a good one. I think somewhere, if we look here, you'll see an H1 yeah, right, right there. OK, yeah. Web pages are done in what's called HTML, all right? And HTML is, and again, if you're going to study computers, you have to learn a million abbreviations. I think that's like 50% of the job description. HTML is a language for web pages, all right? And the letters HTML, anyone know what they stand for? Hypertext markup language. And one of the students already used the word markup. And we'll talk about that in a second. So text we already know. All right? So text we already know because we said text are just words, letters, numbers, punctuation symbols, just you know, stuff that you can type in a, in a keyboard. That is text. What do we mean by hypertext? Any sci-fi fans in here? Oh, come on, there has to be a few sci-fi fans. All right. What, what does it mean when they go into hyperspace in stuff? They go faster. So they're going faster than normal when you, like, uh, is it Star Trek or Star Wars or one of them? Both Have hyperdrives. Ooh, engage the hyper hyperdrive. Uh, you know, what, Yoda or whoever. All right. <laughs> what does that mean? The hyperdrive. It means that it's, it's, it's more than the regular drive. It goes faster than the regular drive. So it could go hyper. If you say someone's hyperactive, what does that mean? It means they're more active than normal. All right? So anytime you, word, you see the word hyper, it, it means like beyond, more than normal. So the phrase hypertext means that we're, we're, we're beyond regular text. 
we have more than just plain old text. So we use text for the language, yet we're able to show more stuff than text. And we already said that, right? Because we have images. We have links. We have uh, uh, videos. We have all these other things that are beyond normal text. So hypertext simply means that a web page have more, has more than just words on it, beyond text, all right? Has these all these other cool features. Now, someone used the word markup, and markup language means that the way this is accomplished, the way we can take ordinary letters and words and show a whole bunch of different stuff is through the use of, the use of what's called markup. All right. Now, some of you, I'm going to use this book here because it's been sitting here for a bunch of semesters and no one's opened the plastic, so I assume no one cares about it. Some of you mark up your textbook, right? You mark them up with a highlighter or with a pencil or whatever. So let's pretend this is our textbook, all right? So let's say we're on this page. All right, so let's say that this paragraph here is really important, all right? What are you going to do? Well, you're going to take your highlighter or your pencil or pen or whatever and mark it up. You're actually going to put some indication on there that this is not an ordinary paragraph. This is one that I darn well better learn because it's going to be on the test. So you might highlight it or draw a box around it. And if I say this paragraph down here is really doubly extra important, you might put a rectangle around it, maybe put some stars next to it. You're, mark, you're literally marking up the page. You're putting extra stuff on here that takes these words and gives them extra meaning. So this just isn't a plain old paragraph, this is an important paragraph. This isn't just a plain old paragraph, it's a really important paragraph. On the other hand, if I say, well, this isn't really that important, don't worry about it, it's, it's out of date, you might put an X through it. All right? That's a different kind of markup that shows something else. So the markup that you put on this page gives extra meaning to the words that are there. And that's exactly what you do in HTML. You use these things called tags to mark up your text, all right? Tags and markup are pretty much synonymous, all right? So I'm going to use tags to indicate some special meaning about the stuff that I put on a web page. So I'm going to start off making a web page. We might not get through the whole web page today, just a warning, all right? But we'll start it off, and then Thursday we'll finish it off, or uh, if you want to read uh, in the book on your own to see how you would finish this off, that's fine as well. But I'm going to create a web page. And let's say I'm going to create a web page about HTML. All right, that seems like a reasonable thing. So, I'm going to start off, and I'm going to mark up this text. HTML is an important concept in this class. Actually, I'm not going to do this, because that's your homework assignment. You guys almost tricked me. All right? I'm on to you now. All right? I'm going to pick a different topic. What would be a good different topic? Um, tips about getting out of your driveway in the winter. Buy a shovel. Number one, buy a shovel. Right. <laughs> All right, so this page is going to be about winter safety. That's the topic of the whole page. So that's the most important thing on the page. So I'm going to put it in what's called an H1 tag. H1 stands for heading. One of the students mentioned before that we had a heading tag on the ESPN page. Well, H1 means heading or header, all right? 
And the one indicates that it's the number is is, is the top most important heading on the page. Now that doesn't mean that there only can be one. There can be multiple things that are of top importance. So don't think it's the only one that's top level importance or, or top importance. Think it's the top level of importance. All right. So. Maybe I'll have H2 that talks about shoveling. H2 indicates it's still a header, but it's a second level header. All right? It means it's of secondary importance. In other words, if you were in English class and you were making an outline about a report, all right, your outline would look like this. Then maybe you'd have shoveling and be driving and see home tips, something like that. If you're writing a paper, you'd do that. And then under each of these areas, you might write a paragraph about shoveling, you know, be sure that, you know, you, you, you don't overexert yourself, uh, dress warmly, you know, those kinds of safety tips. And under driving, you would have safety tips for driving, and under home tips, you'd say, you know, leave the faucet open a little bit so the pipes don't freeze, that, those sorts of things. All right, so if you were doing an outline in an English class, this is what your outline might look like. On a web page, you're going to have H1s to indicate the top level heading. So... H1, oh shit, shucks. I deleted that. Is there an undo? No, not for that. Ah. Um, anyhow, we know what that looked like. There'd be an H1 for this, an H2 for shoveling, An H2 for driving. And then an H2 for home tips. So I'm going to put just a little paragraph of information underneath each of them. Notice that, again, it's not like they're each one, two, three, four, five. It's not like the sequence of them. It's how important they are. So H1 is considered of top level importance. So it's an H1. H2 are considered secondary importance. So these three things are sort of subtopics underneath this. So you create the page that way. And then maybe I will have paragraphs. So paragraphs I will say, be sure to dress warm. Don't overexert yourself. So let's look at this. And I'll do the same thing. I'll just quickly put some other paragraphs underneath these. Don't drive too fast. H1 through H6. And H1 indicates that that's a top level heading. 
So treat it like a top-level heading. So by default, what do you think the browser is going to do with a top-level heading? It's going to make it the biggest, right? And H2 is going to be a little bit smaller, H3 is a little bit smaller, H4 is a little bit smaller, and so on down the line. Now, that doesn't mean that there are only six headings. There are six levels of headings. All right? H2 is just a little less important, so it's going to be a little bit smaller. A P tag is an ordinary paragraph, so it's going to be ordinary sized font, like the normal font that you would see on a page, and so on down the line. Line. Notice these tags come in pairs. You have this, which is a tag, and tags are always enclosed in these angle brackets, the less than and greater than sign. And there's a second tag that goes with the first tag. This tag is called the starting tag. This is called the ending tag. And the only difference between the starting and the ending tag is the ending tag has a slash before the name of the tag. So, name of the tag, ending tag. What that means is everything between here and here is meant to be a top-level heading. All right? Everything between here and here is a secondary heading. Everything between here and here is just an ordinary paragraph. So tags are pretty much all the time going to come in pairs. One thing, you know, keep in mind that there are often exceptions to these sorts of rules, right? So if I say tags always come in pairs, mentally substitute almost always come in pairs, all right? So because, you know, nothing's 100% true. So if I say, well, these tags are in pairs, yeah, usually they are. <coughs> so let's go and view this web page in a browser. Now, there's two ways that we're going to view web pages in this class. We're going to view them in a text editor. I'm using Notepad++. And Notepad++ is nice because it does some color coding and it has some nice features. All right? You don't have to use Notepad++, but it's a free download. All right? So you can use that. If you have a Mac instead of a PC, there are other things that are available, and I can point some of them out to you as well. When we're viewing it through a text editor, like Notepad++, we're sort of like doing an x-ray. We're seeing the guts of the code. We're seeing the internals of the code. That's how we're going to see it because we're the web developers, and we're making this web page. So we need to see all the nuts and bolts. All right? We're also going to view the web page through a web browser, which is how everyone else in the world is going to see our web page. <coughs> All right? So, I'm going to save this as a web page, and then we're going to view it in the browser. So, I'm going to go up to File, Save. I need to change this to HTML. All right, so file type I need to change as H, save as HTML, and I need to give it a name, and I need to end it with .html. So I'm going to type in winner.html. And I'm going to save it on my desktop. Be sure you remember where you save your files at. All right, and be sure that your file name ends with a .html. And be sure that you've changed the type, if you're using Notepad++, to HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. So I'm going to save it. And now notice, because it knows this is an HTML document, it does a little color coding for you, which is nice. Now, notice that that file is saved on my desktop. And there's a little E there, which indicates that the default browser for this machine is Internet Explorer. If I double click it, it will ask me what browser I want to open it in. And I'm going to choose Google Chrome. And I open it up, and there's my web page. So, there's only one web page here, remember. But there's two views of it. 
this is the view in the browser. This is the view that we as developers are going to have for it. And notice that it worked just the way that I said it did. In other words, the things in the H1 are bigger. The things in the H2 are a little bit smaller than the H1s, but they're bigger than the ordinary paragraphs. And then you have the ordinary paragraphs. Now, what happens if you forget a tag? Let's say I forget this end H2. Notice what it did. That paragraph is bigger. Why is that paragraph bigger? Because we didn't close it to the end of driving. Okay. It's considered it part of the H2. It goes, yeah, it thinks that everything from the starting H2 way to this H2 is part of this header. And so it makes that whole thing, even the paragraph, it thinks it's part of the header. So it makes it bigger. So the ending tag tells the browser, well, hey, this is where you stop that kind of formatting. This is the end of that little unit here. So everything between here and here is an H1 tag. Oh, I'm sorry, H2 tag. If I forget this, what's happening here is, it knows that it's not part of the H1 tag because I've closed the H1 tag. But I haven't started a new tag. So therefore, it just thinks it's plain ordinary text. And that's why it's not any bigger. Here's the interesting thing about HTML. Is if you follow the rules and you do everything correctly, your page will most of the time look correct. If you break the rules, you don't know necessarily what's going to happen. It might work, it might not work. For example, if I omit this paragraph tag, the page doesn't really look any different than if I put the paragraph tag in. All right? So HTML sometimes is forgiving. It just depends on what specific error you make whether it's going to cause you difficulties or not. All right? It's sort of like if I make a if I use a sentence and I use incorrect grammar. You might be able to understand me anyhow. All right? Or it might confuse you and you might get the wrong idea. Browsers are sort of like that. If you use correct HTML syntax, it might cause you a problem or the browser might sort of figure it out and display it the way that you want to. I'm going to just spend a minute wrapping up here. We're going a little long because we had a late start. All right. But this is not an entire web page. All right. This is the start of a web page. So your first assignment shouldn't look like this. This will be sort of part of your first assignment, would look something like this. All right. But there's more tags that we have to add on to that to make it a complete web page. And we'll do that on Thursday. Okay? Um, so, unless you read ahead or you've already been familiar with it, you're not quite ready to do all of the first assignment yet. You can get a start on it if you want. Let's take a minute to look at the first assignment. The first assignment is... Research the following topics. So go on the internet and do a search on these topics. HTML, HTML5, CSS. Then you'll create a web page that has an article, and we'll talk about articles next time, about each of the topics, summarizing what you have learned. Each article should contain at least one well-written paragraph. Use the tags covered in Chapter 1. So essentially, you're going to create something like this. CISS 216 Topics. HTML, HTML5, CSS. And then you'll create other tags that have information about it from what you've learned. So this assignment is twofold. 
One is to introduce these topics of HTML, HTML5, and CSS to you. So hopefully by visiting the web pages and reading, you'll get an idea of what these topics are. But then you're going to create a simple web page that has a short explanation about each of these topics using the tags that we've covered. Again, these are our start, but uh, we'll finish them up on Thursday. So during lab, you can start researching uh, what HTML, HTML5, and CSS are. You can start creating a web page like this. All right. And again, we'll wrap up Thursday the tags that you need to complete it. Any questions? All right. We'll see you over in lab.